Get you through when the road is long and you want to quit because you think you've got nothing left to give. You can fall apart, fall into his arms. He will carry you. He will. Open your Bibles, John chapter 11. John chapter 11, keep them there. We're just going to read a couple verses right now, but we're going to look at a good portion of John chapter 11. <clears throat> and uh, I usually have my iPad and I preach from it, but this is a message, uh, uh, well, that I, I, I think I preached in jail uh, when I was a chaplain. And uh, I've not preached it since, so it's in this Bible. It's not in my my uh, my database, so to speak, and so um, 
Just read a couple verses here, verses 25 and verse 26. The Bible says this, Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then he asked this question, and that's my question today. Believest thou this? Believest, believest thou this? And to put it into modern day vernacular, and don't I'm not changing the word of God just to make it, because I don't talk like that. Believest thou this? I'm not Shakespearean. But he says, Martha, do you believe me? Do you believe what I'm telling you? We've got God's word, and God wants to know, are you going to believe my word or not? So that's our question today. Dear Heavenly Father, when I come to you again, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need your goodness to rain down upon this church, this building, this moment right now. Lord, I need, uh, Lord, for the Holy Spirit to do what only it can. Lord, as we look at this account in the Word of God, I pray, Lord, that uh, you would help us, Lord, to, to see what you want us to see. Lord, I pray, Lord, for even... Holy Ghost power. Or maybe I'm saying one thing, but Lord, you'll have to say another to the heart that is here. And I know that this is a specialty of Jesus, and I'm asking the Lord to do it all you can. Lord, encourage your children. Lord, redeem the lost. Lord, we call on you because you are the only one that can do these things, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I know this is a familiar passage for many. The conversation that's going on here between Jesus Christ and Martha. Martha was a sibling of uh, 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 Lazarus and Mary. They lived in Bethany. They lived in a commune with a uh, uh, with a man by the name of uh, uh, Simon. And Simon was Judas Iscariot's father. They lived in this commune. So uh, there's a great account of, of Jesus coming to town and them having a great big old feast and, and them putting on a great service and everything. And, and uh, man, I love that account. This is, this is what happened before that account, though. Jesus Christ is off over in another place, and he gets word uh, that from Mary and Martha that Lazarus, the Bible says, whom thou lovest is sick. If you'll go to uh, John chapter 11 there, uh, um, uh, it says there uh, in uh, verse 3, Therefore his sister sent unto him, that's Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Now, in context, I hope you understand that they were telling him he was sick and they were saying, Lord, come help. Lord, come help. They were letting him know. Now, they, you don't want to tell God what to do, right? So they're trying to approach this the right way. So they're not going to say, God, come heal him. Jesus, come heal him. But just, just in case he didn't know. Now, I find that a little funny. Because guess what? Did Jesus know? Amen. Jesus knew. Jesus knew exactly what was going on. Jesus wasn't surprised. I love that. Brother George Griffin said this years ago, and I'm sure he didn't come up with it, but it just was amazing. And it dawned on me that it's never dawned on, that nothing has ever dawned on God. God's never surprised. God's never up there going, oh man, I didn't think about that. Okay. Jesus wasn't surprised when they came, when the messengers came. Uh, now you understand this took a couple days journey for them to get to where Jesus was from Bethany. <clears throat> and so he hears that Lazarus is sick. So the request is made. Jesus come. Lazarus, whom thou lovest, is sick. Please come. Now, you might say, well, it doesn't say, please come. No, it doesn't. That's implied. Amen? You understand that, right? So the request is, Lord, you love Lazarus, right? Well, we love him too. We can't do anything. The doctors can't do anything. There's only one that can help, and it's you. So please, please, Lord. So they make this request. When Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. So you understand now, while Jesus gets this message, there's a group of people there with him. The disciples are with him, the apostles, you might say. And, and the disciples, there's a difference, and I've talked about this before. Uh, the apostles were the twelve chosen by Jesus Christ to follow him. Uh, the disciples are all others that decided to follow him and to learn from him. And so they're, uh, as a group there, listening to whatever it is that Jesus is trying to uh, uh, convey to them. And I'm sure Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God. That's all he ever talked about. Why? Because that's what he came to talk about. He came to bring the kingdom of God to humankind. And so uh, he's talking, and, and so the news comes. And so Jesus, you know, imagine if you're there, and Jesus is giving you some uh, great word, and you're getting a good word, and all of a sudden somebody, it wouldn't be weird if somebody busted in church right here and said, hey, guess what's going on over here, Right? 
I mean, I would have a hard time going on with what needs to go on because I'm easily distracted as it is. So, but imagine, now Jesus doesn't get distracted. I'm so glad Jesus doesn't have ADOS, amen? But Jesus didn't have that. So Jesus lets them all know because they're all like, oh no, Lazarus is sick. What's he going to do? You know, questioning what he's And Jesus said, it's okay. It's okay. And he reminded them, he said, this sickness is not unto death. Now he might be like, now wait a second, pastor. I know that story and Lazarus dies. So did Jesus lie? <laughs> Does Jesus lie? Okay, so Jesus didn't lie. Jesus is telling the truth. He says, this sickness is not unto death. He says, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Thereby, You know, uh, I want to remind you that maybe uh, you're born again. You know Jesus Christ, your Savior. You, and man, that, what a tremendous song Mr. Reed just sang uh, about God carrying us through. But I want to remind you that when times do get tough, when things are hard, when something does seem impossible, that God has allowed that in your life. Because we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and are the called according to His purpose. That's what the Bible says. So we are going to believe what God says or not. And so God is reminding, Christ is reminding them that are with him, listen, this is for the glory of God. You know God allows things in my life to bring him glory, things that I don't like. You ever thought about that? Pastor, I'm really wrestling with this, or this happened and I don't know what to do. And you know, uh, uh, somebody was telling me about something today, and I said, you know what? God says for us to rejoice when those things happen. But I don't want to rejoice. Me either. <laughs> I like wallowing. It's more fun. It's really not, okay? We, we like to wallow and go, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, this is, this is never done like this before. Nobody knows how I feel. We go into this whole pity party, don't we? Right? But see, the Bible tells us that we have a high priest that is touched by our infirmities. We have someone who has been tested at all points, yet without sin. Jesus understands. Don't ever believe that lie that he doesn't understand. He understands. He gets it. And so Jesus wants to remind those who are with him. He says, this is not a death, but for the glory of God. Why? So that the Son of God might be glorified. He was saying, look, Lazarus is going through this so that God can get some glory through what I'm going to do. So you know what he didn't do? He didn't get up and head toward Bethany. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard, therefore, that, La that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place that he was. Now, that might be a bit... Uh, well, I call it the riddle. That's the riddle. We had the request. Jesus gave a reminder. Now there's a riddle. Why did Jesus stay? Why, wasn't there any urgency in Jesus? You know, <clears throat> God has a different timeline than I do. Amen? And anybody that's walked with him at all, you understand God has a different timeline than you do. Because we want God to fix things. Well, one, we want him to fix them the way we want. And then we want him to do it when? Now. Right? Patience is a virtue that most of us do not possess. Okay? Um, and if we do possess it, it's because you've been through a whole lot and God has stretched out that faith. I know, Josie, so that you might have some patience. But the riddle is why did he stay? Why did he stay put? Then after that, he saith to his disciples in verse 7, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Now there's a reason for Jesus not to go to Bethany. To Bethany's a, a, a part in Judea. There's a reason for him not to go, because the folks wanted to take his life. So there was some opposition here. There was some resistance. So the disciples say, Lord, you don't want to go there. They're going to, they're going to take your life. And I've said this when we did our study through John, which took quite a while said this often, it's very sad that we too often, like the disciples, really don't understand who Jesus is. We do, really don't understand what he's doing and what he's trying to do. And oftentimes we let what is going on, what opposition we see, cause us to take pause instead of follow. And the disciples were like, well, Lord, should we really go? Why? Well, they feared for his life. But he came to lay his life down, didn't he? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, but because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, 
but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit, Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking rest and sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Well, wait a second, Lord, you just said a few minutes ago, or a couple days ago, that this wasn't a sickness unto death, and now you're telling us he's dead. Lord, you waited too long. You might be like, well, the disciples didn't think that. You would have. I would have. Well, way to go, God. You didn't fix that, did you? You guys have never blamed God for not doing what you wanted, right? I'm the only one. Yeah. He tells him, well, I just sleep. He gives him a great analogy here, but if a man walk in the day, you, know, you get to see because you're in the light. You guys just keep with me. I'll show you. He says, but if you walk in darkness, listen, and we've talked about this before, okay? All of my pain receptors apparently are attached to my piggy toe. Okay? Because if I walk in the darkness, you know what I'm talking about, Katie, right? Because I walk in the darkness and I'll stub my piggy toe, well, my world is over, okay? I'm, there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, okay? So you know what I do? I don't walk in the darkness, all right? I don't. Well, even in a familiar area, you know why? Because I got people that put stuff where it ain't supposed to be, all right? Why? Because they're trying to hurt my piggy toe. So I don't like walking in darkness, so I, I'm just, man, it, I couldn't imagine, you know, I, I was about to pull my phone out of my pocket, I don't have it. That phone, my phone's got a flashlight on it, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, you always have, I will always have a light. You know what? When you got Jesus, you always have light. If you walk in darkness, it's your choice. You, it's your choice. And so he gives him this analogy, and he says, you know, fellas, I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm going I'm to speak plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then he says this, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. What an odd thing for Jesus to say. It's almost like he said, Lazarus is dead and I'm happy. All right, but no, wait a second, Lord, you loved him, but that, let's go on. I am glad for, I, for, for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. If I was a disciple, I would be absolutely befuddled right now. And I bet you they were. Now, wait a second. It's not unto death, but he's dead. And, you know, we are supposed to walk in light, but we feel like we're in the dark, okay? And, and, and now you're telling us uh, that he is dead and that you did it on purpose and that we need to believe. What do we need to believe? I mean, you're Jesus. We know you're Jesus. We're following you. Have you ever done that? God, I, I do believe, I, I, duh, I'm following you, Right? You ever been like that? Again, I'm the only one. Right? Lord, what's going on here? I mean, I'm your. Are, are I not your follower? Let me in. I, I've often asked God if He just let me in on some stuff, right? Just let me in on it a little bit, please. He says, "I'm glad for your sake that I was not there. That to the intent you may believe." See, again, they still haven't had the right view of who Jesus is, and this is going to help them. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. You ever been with that guy? Right? Mr. Overzealous? Oh, well then let's all go die. Hey, shut up, dummy. Right? That's what I said. I'm surprised Peter didn't. I, maybe he did and it just wasn't written down, it wasn't recorded. Because that's what I said. Hey, what's wrong with you? You don't want to die? Are you crazy? But there's that guy. There, the, I was at a preacher's conference, and there's at least two of those guys that I'm friends with. They're that guy, okay? So there he is, saying something weird. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. So four days. Too late, right? Lazarus is dead. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and to Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Huh. Now we see kind of a response here. Martha blamed God. I mean, 
I think some of the disciples might have already been doing it silently. But Martha says, Lord, if you'd been here. You don't think she pointed her finger? I don't know. I mean, you ever had a woman that's mad at you? And that finger don't come out, right? And the head goes. I, 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 that's just me. I thought, here. Jesus, if you'd been here, all right? I know women don't actually have that kind of, Not biblical women. They wouldn't have that attitude. Lord, if you'd been here. But then she says, with faith. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou would ask of God, God will give it to you. And Jesus says this, thy brother will live again. Now automatically, she goes back to Torah. Okay, She hears that and she goes back to the Old Testament teaching that there will be a resurrection of the dead, that, 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 that all this, the kingdom of God is all going to be set up, You know that they would learned from Daniel and all these things. And so she goes back to that and she says, yeah, I, I know he's going to live again. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. He goes, well, I know that. I know that. But that's not this. That's not this. Martha said unto him, I know that. Jesus said unto her, I, and this is our text verse, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She says this unto him, yes, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ and the Son of God, which should come into the world. So she says, well, yeah, I believe. But see, here's the thing. As the story goes on, we don't see that she does believe. See, I can say I believe all that I want. I had a discussion with somebody some time ago, and they kept telling me they believed that they were walking by faith. The only thing is their life was showing that they were not. But I, I'm trusting him. I'm trusting Jesus. They kept telling me, Pastor, I'm trusting Jesus. I'm following him. Okay, then why are you calling me after a three-day bender? But I'm trusting him. I mean, I just messed up, but I'm trusting him. And so I started saying this to them. I'm a pretty princess. Now, I mean, I'm dashing, but I'm not pretty. Okay? And I'm definitely not a princess. And she just goes, what? I said, I'm a pretty princess. Said, what does that mean? I said, well, if I figure if I say it enough, it must be true, right? She goes, what do you mean? I said, you can tell me that you believe Jesus Christ is your God and that you're following him all that you want. But you don't actually believe it's true. If I actually believe I'm a pretty princess, you know what I do? I've got my granddaughter, Isla. We just had her third birthday. It was a princess party, Okay. Pink and purple threw up all over the place, all right? She had on her tiara. She had on her Rapunzel gown. She would twirl. She had a great time. She was a pretty princess. I thought about dressing up as a princess and going. Okay? But that would have been the closest thing I'd ever gotten to being a pretty princess. And I don't think it would have been pretty at all. But I didn't do it, all right? I didn't do it. It would have been funny. I showed Shrek. <laughs> That's not funny. But you can say you believe all that you want, but James tells us this, that faith without works is what? Dead. You can talk all you want. You can talk all you want. You can say you know Jesus. You can say you know Jesus. But Jesus said, do you really? That's what he's asking today. Do you really know me? Do you really know who I am? Let's go on down. Verse 31 says this, Then the Jews, then which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw that Mary, that she rose up and hastily went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come here, Jesus come where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Now, you know Martha and Mary are different people, right? And boy, if we don't see it right here. I, this is how I see Martha. Lord, if you had been here, and I might be wrong, okay? I just, that's how I see Martha. Martha's a busybody. Search the scriptures, okay? See if these things are so, all right? But Mary comes and just worships. She just comes and she falls at his feet. And not, Lord, if you had been here, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand. She didn't get it. Jews saw her weeping 
the Jews also weeping, which came with her. Jesus saw this and he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He said, where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. Let me see a shortest verse, the most quoted verse in the Bible. Jesus wept, right? Man, I, there's so many different viewpoints as to why he wept. And my viewpoint is this. I believe it broke Jesus' heart for the Son of God to be standing there, the resurrection of the life to be standing there. But everybody and their heart were absolutely filled with doubt. So a sad thing that he had done so very much. He had given his word. You know, here's the problem, though. We struggle to believe his word. They're just words to us. Why? Because most times what we have falling out of our face is just words. Just words. Jesus wept. Those there said, wait, well, this is this is that guy. If, he, if he's the, the one that does all the healing, couldn't if he have healed him so he wouldn't sick? So he wouldn't have died. So then Jesus groans again and he goes to the grave. The grave's there and the grave's got a stone on it. <clears throat> Lazarus has been in there four days now. He's been dead four days. Two days for the messengers to go tell Jesus. Jesus waited two days. And so two days. So he must have lived two days. So it's been six days since he received the message. So he must have lived two days. Now he's been dead for four days. And so Jesus says this in verse 39. Take ye away the stone. Now we see where Martha's faith really is. Didn't Jesus already said, your brother's going to live again? Didn't he? Jesus gave the word, right? He gave the word. Now, we're either going to believe the word or we don't believe the word. That's simple truth. And it doesn't matter how much you say you believe the word. You can say you believe it all you want. But if you believe it, your life will show up. Martha still didn't believe. Because he says, take the stone away. She said, Lord, by this time he stinketh. For he hath been dead four days. So Jesus says again, said I not unto you, unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. An amazing thing happens. And I see here, though, Jesus says, take the stone away, and I see the responsibility. See, okay, so we don't believe. We're struggling to believe. You know, there's been many times I've been struggling to believe what God has said to me, and he's given me some direction, like he said here, take the stone away. But Lord, I don't... <laughs> I don't think you understand the situation, right? Because that's what Martha said. He's been dead. That's Lord, I don't think you get it. I don't think you understand who I am. I don't think you understand what's going on, God. But see, here's the thing. We have a responsibility just to obey. Now, the Bible, we got that, that song we like, trust and obey, right? We're to trust and obey. That's not actual Bible, but we have it in Proverbs chapter 3. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine understanding. That means trust him and obey. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Great verses. So we get the concept of trust and obey. To live by faith. And so uh, we have this responsibility to just obey whether we get it or not. There's been plenty of times I've had to obey God and I don't understand what he's doing. There's been plenty of times I've had to do what he wanted me to do and I don't get it. And, and I, I don't think, and in my heart of hearts when I'm being honest, if I'm being honest, I don't think he gets it. Why? Well, because we believe we, we believe us way more than we believe him. There's a terminology for that, and I'm just going to be really crass and say it. It's called stupid. Okay? When we believe us over God, when we take our word over his word, that's just stupid. Okay? I mean, let's see. The creator of the universe said this, but I think this, or I feel this, or I desire this, or I want this. You might be like, well, I don't think that way. Tell me how you do that, please. Okay? Because I wrestle with these things. And so, the responsibility is just to obey. In, in the middle of your doubt, go ahead and obey. 
So they take the stone away. Lazarus is there, he's dead. And Jesus prays, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. He says, Lord, I'm going to talk to you, and I thank you that I know you hear me, but I know you always hear me. But this prayer isn't so much for me and you, but it's for them. He says, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice. I wish, I wish I could have been there just, just to hear this, just this right here, three words. Lazarus, come forth. Now, I've heard preachers say he had to say Lazarus because if he just said come forth, that grave would have been emptied <laughs> because whoever was in there would have come out. Why? Hey, we're talking about God here, okay? He is the resurrection. If he says you're alive, then you're alive. I don't say I'm alive. He says it. You don't say you're alive. He says it. But he cries out, Lazarus, come forth! Now, again, this is my mind. My mind is weird. I think of things differently, really, okay? It's just how I work, right? So you understand that the Israelites had spent 400 years in Egypt, right? And the Egyptians had mastered the art of mummification or preserving a dead body, all right? They would take out, if you don't know what they would do, they'd take out all the organs, which is kind of cool and kind of gross at the same time, right? Take out all the organs and they put in all these preservatives and stuff, and then they'd bind up the body in these bandages, okay? And so, you know, the Bible says here, when Lazarus comes forth, Jesus says, loose him and let him go. Because he came forth in his grave clothes. Look at this. This is what I picture. Now, that's just me, or maybe he was doing the shuffle. I don't know. But I see Lazarus coming forth. And you know what? Jesus had done a miraculous thing. I mean, here he was. He was dead. He was dead. Aaron, dead. There have been those that want to cast doubt on the Word of God and said, uh, Lazarus was simply in a coma. Okay. Yes. Okay. He was dead. You know why? The Bible says he's dead. I'm just going to go ahead and take God's word for it. And so, Lazarus being dead, here's his name. Now, and this is just, again, the way that I think. I don't think Lazarus was very happy about being resurrected. You know why? He was in Abraham's bosom. Right? He was in paradise. Bethany, not paradise. Paradise, paradise. Right? And so he's probably like, ah, oh, man. Right? You ever woke up from a really good dream? I'm talking about, like, you know, I, I hated those commercials back uh, in the early 2000s where this guy would wake up and he's in a room filled with chocolate chip cookies, right? All gorgeous. And he's, and he's just like, ooh, chocolate chip cookies. And then got milk. There's no milk. Right? Well, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a dream. It was a nightmare. Okay? But, man, you ever, you ever had one of those dreams where, man, I don't know, you're winning the battle, you're flying through the air, whatever it is that you dream, and you might be like, what are you dreaming, Larry? I know, right? Weird. So, but when you're dreaming and it's really, really good, and all of a sudden you wake up, you're like, oh, man. Imagine if you were Lazarus and you've been in paradise for four days, all right? Now, this is, again, I, I have weird viewpoints and opinions, all right? So I personally believe, I personally believe that this paradise was much like the Garden of Eden, if not the Garden of Eden, that that's where they're at. And he's eating from the most beautiful trees. And he's spending time, man, he's spending time with King David, all right? He's spending time with Moses. I mean, Moses, right? Moses, what was it like to hit a rock and see water come out? Not once, but twice, right? These are the things that I would ask, all right? Joshua, when the walls of Jericho fell, okay, what did you do? How did you feel? Explain it to me in great detail. This is me. This is, hey, you, you wait. When we get in heaven, this is what I'm going to be doing, right? I'm going to be running around saying, Peter, Peter, come here. When you step foot on that water, I mean, seriously, dude, would you like, what is going on? Right? I'm going to ask these questions. So here's Lazarus in the greatest dream he'd ever had for four days, and he's like, oh, man. And you might be like, are you? Again, this is just the way that I view it, okay? But he comes out, been made alive by Jesus Christ. He's in these grave clothes. And God says, loose him and let him go. 
Now, there's something really important about that. Josie agrees with me. That's those are all amens, right? See, each and every one of us, we're born into this world. And we're born innocent. Amen? I mean, guess what? I, I wasn't a horrible, wicked dude until I turned like eight, maybe. Right? Then start turning into that horrible. I was pretty innocent up until. And most of us have that, however many years it is, of innocence. Where if we were to pass, then we just go on to heaven because we're not accountable for our sins yet. We don't, we don't know the difference between good and right, right, uh, good and bad, right and wrong. But seeing that age of accountability hits, and it's different for everybody. You're like, what is it, Pastor? For me, I think it was about eight. That's when I really, first time ever, fell under a conviction, really, the whole thing. That I was wrong and God was right. See, that's when I realize that I'm wrong. When I realize that I'm a sinner, then I have to accept the fact that my sins, their end is death. That's the Bible. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death. That means what I get, what I'm owed for what I've done is death. So I'm a dead, I'm a dead man walking without Jesus. I'm a dead man walking with that. The best I could do, if I lived a perfect life, if I lived as good as I could live, and all I did was serve others and do good for others and love people and just uh, speak good all the time and, and always have positive thoughts with, there's nobody like this. I don't care what they say. This is just a, it's impossible because the Bible says there's none that do it good. No, not one. And so, but even if I did, if I did the best that I could, I'm still going to be held accountable for my sins. I'm still going to stand before a holy, 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 righteous God, and he's going to say, what did you do with my son, Jesus? You see, every human being at some point in time is going to have Jesus standing outside the grave of your life, and he's going to say, hey, you, come forth! Because he wants you to know life. He wants you to come out of that dead state that your sins have condemned you in. And he wants to give you life because he is the resurrection. And he is the life. See, Lazarus was resurrected when he came out in those grave clothes. But being loose and let go, that was life. That was life. See, God takes off my grave clothes and he gives me this robe of righteousness. He gives me the goodness of God so that I am no longer dead. And if I believe this, the Bible says, I shall never die. And don't get me wrong, if the Lord tarries one day, this body is going to lay in the dirt and turn into dirt. Okay? If the Lord tarries. But see, I'm not this body. I'm not this body. See, I'm a living soul because I've been made in the likeness and the image of God Almighty. And the day that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, the day he said, Larry, come forth. And I heard that cry. He breathed life into this old dead man and gave me life. Then he said, now take off those old grave clothes. I mean, take, shed this flesh. And here's my righteousness. He's given me the opportunity to believe everything that he says. And every time I believe what he says, I'm blessed. I don't mean that he puts money in my bank or gas in my tank. It just means that I have peace, joy, and the understanding and knowledge of his love. That he, he did all this because he loved me. That loosen and letting go is so important that you can't be loosed and let go if you're still in the grave. I know what it's like to grow up in church, grow up in a Christian school, hear my name called and stay in the dead, in, in, in the grave. I know what it's like. And you know why we do that? You know why we stay in our grave? Because we, for some sick, weird, demented, wicked reason, we like our death more than the life that Christ has.
Do you believe that if you call on Jesus, you're going to get life? Do you believe that if you call on Jesus, you have life? Jesus is saying, do you believe me? Do you take my word for it? Heads about and eyes are closed. Stand with me if you would. Nobody looking around. Let's keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I, I'm not going to call on anybody. I'm not going to do anything to embarrass anybody. I promise you. And everybody, I'm looking around. Everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I just want to pray for you. And if you just allow me to pray for you. Maybe you realize today that you're still that dead man walking. You're still in that grave. And, and you've never answered that call. Nothing